Monday. I hope you all are doing well. This is uh, Aaron Wells. I um, am helping to facilitate the risk management roundtable today, and I have a couple other people with me. I'm going to let them introduce themselves. Hey, y'all. My name is Drew Losa. I'm the Assistant Director of Facilities Management and Operations at the University of Notre Dame. I'm Chad Lowe. I'm the Assistant Director for Strategy and Organizational Effectiveness at Ohio State University. Sarah Shea, Assistant Director of Facilities and Aquatics at a and Commerce. Awesome. I think Chad's going to get us started out here. So, Chad, you want to take it for me? Sure. So we will be having another roundtable on April 30th. It will be at 10 o'clock uh, Pacific time, 10 a.m. Pacific time. And we're looking for some feedback and information on different topics we can uh, share during that time. I'm going to share a link uh, for a Google Drive doc. Uh, if you guys can go into that and update that with any topics you'd like to see discussed. Uh, if you have any issues with uh, the document, I'll leave my email address as well. Uh, just so All right, awesome. So first thing we kind of wanted to start out with today, and please remember, use the chat feature at any time with any questions, comments, concerns you may have. We're always monitoring that and we'll bring those up. But the first thing we kind of wanted to talk about today is um, adjusting our SOPs going forward. I know that here at the University of Texas at Austin, we're talking about, all right, so what are we gonna do in the future to kind of mitigate uh, some of these issues that we had right before going into it? So um, we're talking about before COVID-19, our students physically took a ID from people and swiped it and gave it back to them. Well, we're talking about not doing that anymore, about people swiping their own IDs. Um, we're talking about changing every single one of our toilets and our sinks to automatic. So these are just some of the things that we're talking about uh, to, to make some changes in our SOPs going forward. And we kind of wanted to throw it out to y'all What are um, and see if there's anything we hadn't thought of. And what are y'all doing with your SOPs going forward? Is that something you've started talking about? Hey everyone, my name is Megan Sersky. I'm from the Towson University. I'm the Assistant Director for Aquatics and Safety there. Um, I know a couple of you, so hi. Um, I'm on video because I look a little bit of a hot mess right now, so sorry. Um, anywho, for SOPs, um, we have started talking about it a little bit. Um, myself and my Associate Director um, were actually on a call with Connect2, and we were talking a lot about um, journey mapping. Um, if you haven't heard this term yet, I didn't hear it till I went on the call. Essentially what it is, is um, kind of like taking an inventory of every part of your facility where a patron would touch. So like whether it's a door handle, whether it's a swipe, whether it's lockers, all of that. Um, and we actually also did a virtual tour of a facility and kind of talking about you know, a couple of things that might need to change. So for those who have outdoor pools, you know, you have, you might have chairs all lined up together at your pool that might have to change to six feet apart. What do you do for locker rooms? And if you have lockers that are one right next to each other, does that mean you have to start putting up signage um, in order to safely, safely social distance if that's something you want to do? So we've talked about a couple of ways to figure out what we want to change um, and also let our um, fitness staff know as well because we talked about even placement, placement of equipment in our facility and if that needs to change as well. Um, and we're also working on, this isn't due to COVID, but something else we've been looking at a lot is actually getting rid of uh, code colors um, and just going more to like plain text. I know that there was something from FEMA recently um, that's trying to persuade kind of healthcare and doing the same thing because different areas have different codes and it kind of makes everything confusing. So that's kind of that's where we haven't really, we haven't started anything with it yet because we're actually finishing our, um, our, I guess our normal SOPs and then we'll go and add on for COVID if there are any other things we need to change. Anyone else, anyone else wanna share? 
I have a question to raise to the group. It's um, I'm Jeff Lewenthal from the University of South Carolina, um, Operations and Risk Management. I um, was wondering what everyone's plan is to do in terms of equipment checkout. Are you still allowing patrons to check out equipment? Um, are you, if, you, if you're not checking out equipment, are you allowing patrons to bring in their own equipment? Um, and how are you going about that um, in terms of sanitizing and disinfecting equipment that gets used on the, on the daily or on the hour, whatever it is? Hi, Aaron. Uh, my name is Devon. I'm from the city of Northport here, and um, these uh, chats have been pretty awesome because I come from a university. I work for a local municipality, so uh, we actually have a meeting uh, this Friday um, with our director to bring it up to commissioners to kind of go with some of those things you were talking about. Uh, we're definitely going to be doing um, touchless payments now, so you know they can tap their cards, touch like that. Um, scanners, uh, getting the equipment, so that way we don't have to touch those things. Um, I think the uh, the most interesting thing about this whole COVID is, uh, especially down here in Florida, we get a lot of snowbirds and everything, so our flu seasons are usually out of control. But uh, I guess that's the, the the biggest differing factor between this COVID and a regular flu is, you know, once there's a vaccine, is this going to be a long-term thing with our risk? Are we just going to do this until there's a vaccine and, you know, move on as status quo? Because then it won't be as prevalent, you know, as maybe, but... Uh, you know, I definitely questions there. Now for checkouts and such, uh, we had talked about checking out some of our equipment to help um, actually some of the local school districts with the virtual learning. Uh, we decided not to do that uh, just for the sole purpose of not only uh, if people are not cleaning them or that or not taking care of them and could destroy um, some of our equipment and such that we had here at the city. Does anyone have any plans on how they're going to monitor activity spaces? For example, if the CDC guidelines at the time of, of opening back operations is that there's no more than 10 people in the weight room or in any given area, do you have ways in which your students or yourselves are going to monitor those areas? Obviously, budgets are a restriction and making sure that we are abiding by our student employee budgets and the money that we are allotted. Um, but just curious to hear about the equipment um, checkout process as well as monitoring spaces and capacity. Hey Jeff, um, so on an aquatics call, I think it was aquatics last week, there, we were actually talking about American Red Cross classes and how American Red Cross isn't doing any sort of class right now and we probably should follow them in regards to whether we're gonna operate or not. And the reason being is because if you're thinking about it from a risk management perspective, if we're putting guidelines on who can be in the facility at what spaces, where, the other thought we had was, well, what happens for safety? Um, so if you're responding to, you know, so for example, say you're using the facility space, you want everyone a certain feet apart, someone gets hurt, and then you're putting your students in jeopardy when they have to go take care of that emergency. Um, so the kind of the, the thing that we were saying was, if it isn't safe for our students to give care appropriately and to manage risk the way they need to manage it, then there need to be larger conversations with those higher ups that it is not okay for us to open. Um, I don't know if this impacts you or anyone else on the call too, but another thing that I was actually talking with a coworker previously was, I know some facility spaces are being changed to operate as hospitals right now um, for some, at least that's what hap has happened at Towson. Um, so I know like I have a bunch of questions in regards to, you know, if, if Towson reopens, you know, we need to make sure that there's a gap between the time we go back into that facility, especially if COVID patients are being treated at that space. Um, and what does like disinfection look like, especially if we're talking about an airborne, um, we're talking about this being airborne. So what does that mean for our vents and ventilation and everything like that too? Um, but uh, yeah, I think just overall in the end is if it's not safe for us to be able to help in an emergency, then we need to say, hey, we can't open our facility. Now, I don't know, you know, who we like assistant directors probably don't have the power in that. <laughs> that's going to be a higher up thing. Um, but that's those are the conversations that I'm guessing are going to be happening probably first before we get to like you know, do we need, like what, what Devin was saying, like how long are we gonna maintain this and when should we maintain this? I mean, 
And you could have higher ups be like, sorry, you're just going to have to do it no matter what. Um, and then I think that's when the conversation of, okay, well, if we have to, then here's how we're going to try to limit uh, any additional like germs or, you know, spread that we can. Yeah, we've and discussed, and, yeah. Sorry, I'm just gonna say we've discussed going and training our students and just emphasizing compression, compression only CPR. But then again, just goes back to your point on what's the American Red Cross, you know, what are they, what are they doing? And as an authorized provider, you know, us following suit and staying consistent with the CDC as well. Hey, and what does opening mean for you there um, as well? Is you know, is ten people or less? Is that a a back to opening? Is it worth the time if we go to ten or less to even open back up? Um, I know um, at my direct spot, I work at a water park, our maximum capacity is 1,300. Well, when we cut down to 250 people, I had 19 lifeguards watching 250 people. Uh, my, my, my mind was just crazy. I just was watching numbers just tick away and we were not making enough at that point in time. So I think for that, uh, the CDC might aid us in that ability to, you know, if they open up to 10 or 50, it just may be a, hey, it's not worth our staff time right now to do that. Let's kind of hold out and maybe in three weeks that number jumps to 300 plus. So this is OC Wheat Fall, Texas A&M. We recently, we've had all those conversations, Megan, Jeff, and uh, Devon about opening up. And so we actually operated for about two and a half weeks under the CDC standards. And essentially what we did as a staff is we basically, it was easier to say what you could do on courts and what equipment we would give out as opposed to saying, what you couldn't do. So we basically limited it to uh, singles badminton, um, singles uh, racquetball or solo racquetball in the courts. And then um, anything else, we took away basketball, indoor soccer, volleyball. We just took that equipment away and wouldn't let folks use it. Even if they brought it within the facility, they weren't allowed to use it because we did find out that COVID-19 is transferable on equipment such as balls and rackets and things of that matter. And so we stopped checking all that out. We have found through some, some research and some trial and error that simple green does not destroy equipment, especially leather. So if you use it on a towel and then wipe your equipment down with that, that does help as a way to kind of give some type of treatment to your treat, um, rented out equipment. Um, as far as the weight room and strength conditioning area, we still were under those guidelines and we set up obviously the six feet apart for folks to stay in. And we just went to basically a lottery system where each hour a group of X amount of students can sign up for their time. And so that way students weren't waiting at the door. And this is something we did through IM leagues because um, they have that fitness component. We just set all the times up as a league. And the first 50, this one we had 50 folks to sign up, could go in there for that whole hour and about 10 till we would start to clear them out of the facility and then wipe everything down and then bring in the next hour of folks do that and then they would get checked at the door by a student with their ID and if you missed it you missed it uh, we didn't allow a wait list because we tried the wait list initially but we saw that people would gather around waiting to get on that wait list and it would just cause more people in the area than we wanted to. Hey OC when you were in that procedure what did you do about risk management and safety giving care if, with the so, whole six feet rule did you have did you change any of your procedures? Yeah, we have, so our intramural sports staff and some of our sport club staff didn't have anything to do. So we utilized those students to help a space the lines out and make sure people weren't violating the six foot rule. And then in our facilities, we're always, we have medics that are stationed there during the duration. So we always had someone on hand during any type of operation anyway. In their time, since we closed another facility, we were able to bring in two medics at the time. And then all of our supervisors are first aid and CPR certified. In that sense. Uh, Sarah, was that your question? Like, what were, what if, yeah, so, well, the medic, the, come, how would yeah, it give care and come within the six feet? That's, well, that's yeah, part of the question. The medics part answers that because the medics don't, they don't, they don't buy a six feet rule when you're giving mm -hmm. a medic. Um, so that part answers it, but your student staff for giving care, if they were to assist the medic or the medic wasn't there yet, did you tell them, okay, from right here on out, you have no contact or first aid or any giving care. It's only medics because of that six feet rule and protecting your staff. And, and yes and no, it kind of depends on the situation. Obviously it was an emergency situation. They were outfitted with gloves and that's saying it was only just gloves. Um, if they there was a severe issue, they could go to the courts and address those. But for the most part, they had a walkie talkie where they could radio the medic 
to come on site and tell them exactly what's happening at that point in time. Um, just to note, Olivia Rexer from Columbia University here. So we've been closed for a few weeks now. Um, our outdoor facility is um, starting today accepting patients as a COVID hospital, 250 bed. Um, for our field house. Um, so Megan, I can uh, definitely connect with you on information regarding reopening. Um, our last conversation that we had with our athletics counterparts um, was just kind of, we don't know. We're, you know, we're taking it step by step. Obviously no reopening to the public is anywhere in the near future. Um, but right now it'll just kind of depend on how long we remain open as a hospital. And then um, obviously how long the CDC recommends we stay closed after that in between reopening to our athletics and rec um, employees. And I've, I've been on a couple calls with um, New Hampshire folks and they've been, and um, Illinois, and I forget the other, Nebraska, I think. And they've been saying that um, basically they take care of everything, especially if you have a contract with the, with the state or government and I think New Hampshire, and correct me if I'm wrong, if anybody from New Hampshire is in here, they said that they were bringing in the National Guard to take care of all of that after um, after they were released as a hospital. Yeah, we, I know we particularly, we have no, like our grounds folk yeah. and our university facilities folk are going nowhere near um, the field itself and yeah. our indoor complex um, they're using the top two floors for the healthcare staff to use restrooms, meeting rooms, that kind of space. Um, and our facilities workers are going, they're only going on the first two floors. The third floor is kind of remaining as like a no man's land in between the two. So, so yeah, we'll just wait for clearance from them. But if I hear of anything else, Megan, I can get in touch with you. Uh, oh, I was just going to say real quick on uh, Jeff, kind of what you were talking about with limiting space. Um, be prior to us closing, we did, uh, we took out every other treadmill or card piece of cardio equipment. Um, we took out benches in our weight room to limit the amount of people. Um, we also kept our fitness staff um, actively monitoring each floor so that if it exceeded a number of patrons, um, they just asked the patrons to wait um, until somebody left. Um, luckily enough, we had slowed down in numbers that we weren't getting like large amounts of people waiting. So we didn't have to face that as an issue. We also opened up some of our aerobics rooms that we normally don't have open um, to just be additional stretching and free weight space um, to help kind of space out people. We stopped our laundry and our towel service as well as small equipment checkout. Thank you. Mm -hmm. A couple of people in the chat brought up a great point, which is something I was just talking to uh, with my team, is when we're disinfecting our surfaces, making sure that we're following exactly what the disinfectant says. A lot of people think spray and wipe, you're good to go type of deal. Um, I know we were cleaning our deck with chlorine. You're, you're taking chlorine from the water. You're diluting your chlorine there, so the effectiveness is not the same as if you're spraying straight bleach and such there onto the deck. So. Uh, that's very important as we're cleaning these surfaces um, and everything there that we are maintaining the proper disinfectant levels. Hey, Natalie, you want to ask your question to the group? Uh, yeah, I was just wondering if anyone has thought about the HVAC systems that they have in their buildings, um, just because I know uh, at hospitals it's a concern um, placing COVID patients on certain floors just of uh, how the air flows throughout the hospital. Are you talking about people? like has has anyone else in the group considered that because I know that we're talking about social distancing and like turning off machines and things like that um, but someone else mentioned about uh, opening up uh, group fitness rooms to uh, people to use when they're normally not open. I just don't know if anyone else has thought that far. 
Hey Natalie, um, so at Towson, our facilities, crew, like our facilities department is responsible for our HVACs. Um, I actually just wrote down your question to actually have a conversation with them and ask them how they're going to be handling that um, because we are converting to a hospital. So right now, the answer is I don't know. Um, I do think it's something that we probably will need to follow up on. Um, again, I'm not I'm not 100% sure if they've talked about it. I would think they have, but um, that's where we're at right now. Hey, so OC, so there is, so our custodial uh, supervisor, I mean, our maintenance supervisor has uh, just, this is one of the first things we thought about. There is a chemical that you can um, include in your HVAC that does kill COVID-19, it specifically does it. I'm trying to text her right now because the name of it slips me right now, but we were already pushing that through our HVAC system at least once every three months, but we've cut that down to like once every month now. So it does circulate throughout our building consistently working through our HVAC system. But once I get the name, I'll add it in the chat group. Thank you, OC. I was going to ask about anybody who um, has closed already, or maybe if you haven't closed, has anyone considered donating any gloves, hand sanitizer supplies that you have on hand after your closure? So right now we're kind of deciding whether or not to donate the materials that I have in our storage room as far as gloves and hand sanitizer and cleanser go to local facilities. Um, not, I just want to put it out there and see if anybody else has done that already. We have not talked about that as of yet, and Texas has not mandated that we um, donate that yet. I know that a couple states have mandated that, um, mm -hmm. but that has not been a conversation. We would we would only have gloves to donate at this point, so. I think we talked about this in the aquatics one last week, um, there about the donation of materials and the, the we, issue, it's kind of a two-fold, a double-edged sword. If you donate it now, and then you get told next month to open up and now you have nothing uh, there. Um, we closed down, I believe it was March 16th. We shut our facility down and we were on our last box of large gloves. I cannot find large gloves to buy anywhere right now. Uline won't even sell them to me because I'm not a hospital at this point in time um, there. So um, it's definitely kind of that double-edged sword. I, I can at least say in, in some states as we're reaching, you know, here in Florida, they're talking about we could hit our peak. Uh, like the end of this week. So, you know, mm -hmm. hopefully those numbers start and kind of supply start returning back to normal, but that's all going to be part of this, um, you know, kind of, I think what Aaron said, you know, until the state, if the state doesn't mandate that we're doing it, I think we're going to unfortunately hold on to our supplies and then, uh, you know, just kind of hold those because we're going to, we know that we're going to need them when we open back up. Mm -hmm. Okay. And thanks to everybody too, who's typed in the chat. That's helpful. We're just kind of figuring out what we're going to do. So it's good to hear what you guys are all doing. Um, Olivia, I did ask my supervisor to kind of send it up the chain if that's something we needed to do. I know, um, like someone had mentioned, our, um, our academic departments had donated um, what they had. Um, yes, I do think it's like a double-edged sword, like Devin was saying, because you need to make sure you have enough inventory and who knows, like, what the inventory you're gonna need is gonna be considering everything. Um, but the other thing too is the budget piece of it too. Um, I know our, um, so because we work for the state, obviously we have certain mandates that are coming from our procurement office. So right now we are not allowed to use our, our P cards unless it's like, um, unless it's like a certain like continual thing that we need, for example, like our pool needs chlorine and there are certain deliveries like that I'm going to continue to pay for, but I'm not going to go online and purchase like new mannequins for next year. Um, yeah. And I think it's, we're doing that out of, out of maybe super, like being overly cautious, but we just don't know what our budget is going to be for next year. If our budgets, you know, if they're going to ask like, Hey, if you have leftover money in your budget, you're going to like, it's going to have to be set aside or you're going to have to put that toward your capital projects that you thought you were going to get money for. I mean, and I think we haven't had any conversations about furloughs or about anything like that. Um, but I really just think we're trying to be very super cautious right now because we're not sure how long things are kind of going to stay in place. So not only is it that, you know, what Devin brought up of the risk management for if you reopen, but the other side of it is the budget piece. Um, I would love to be able to donate some of it because I feel like 
if if people can't get it and they're the ones who are on the front lines, they should have it if we're not using it. But until, you know, until we're told that we have to give it, unfortunately, it's just not an option for us right now. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. I believe it was Aaron Brooks a little bit back in the um, chat was asking a question about, are there any other states where gyms and recreation facilities are closed until further notice? Um, I know that in the first uh, kind of, not the stay at home, but the essential services, gyms were knocked out in the first one. So I know that um, we, we closed right away because of that and probably will not reopen until um, we're allowed to, even if campus opens, if gyms and recreation senators aren't, what does that mean for us? Is that kind of what you were asking, Erin? Yes. Yes, it was. Awesome. Anybody else have any comments on that one? Questions about that? Does, we've asked this almost in every call I've been on, but does anybody have a reopen date? Um, we don't have a reopen. Uh, do we have a reopen date? I, so we were told through spring semester, which is like May 19th, um, but then last week, all of our university classes got converted to online um, for summer sessions. So we are anticipating that we will not be going back at least until fall, which is a little concerning for us um, because, you know, when you start to think about training and you know, usually we have that week, like we close our facility for a couple days and everything. And will we be able to do that? So it's not definite. It hasn't been said, okay, we're waiting till fall. But the fact that online class, that summer session classes got put online, um, they did stipulate that if the date, you know, if our state um, stay at home is lifted and everything is okay and people can go back, that they would be considering moving it back to in-person. Um, but with everything we're doing with having the hospital there, with, you know, just the need to, even if it is lifted, I still think people would probably want to wait at least two weeks or maybe even three to properly clean, disinfect, whatever. Um, yeah, I, I really don't see us going back any earlier than like June, um, to be very honest. Um, and that's like, that's more me being very hopeful because I want to play beach volleyball and I don't want to be stuck in the house anymore. So, um, but yeah, no specific end date. Our end date originally was April 30th and it got changed. So. Anybody else want to comment on that one? I just have a quick question. Um, we were talking about it in our staff meeting this morning and um, about if anybody is worried, I would say worried if that's the right word, about losing memberships to private facilities. If, if for example, if you go to online classes all summer, but if the ability is so there are no students on campus, so they don't open up facilities for monetary reasons, but if other private gyms or fitness centers are able to, will you lose memberships to that? Hello, this is Dustin from Arizona State University. We have talked a little bit about this, uh, this idea, and I agree that many of our facilities probably around the country uh, will face a membership drop. So, I, I would be happy to continue this uh, discussion as an idea generator, um, but a few things, you know, that, that have been tossed around already would be, um, you know, discounted return to campus type memberships for, for staff. Um, certainly, I'm, I'm uh, thinking that many of uh, you probably put on hold any payroll deductions that were going on or things like that. Um, what other opportunities could we incentivize, particularly our faculty staff uh, members to return to our facilities? Because, you know, I share your concern uh, that was just mentioned in the fact that, you know, maybe community uh, facilities may have the ability to open sooner. Um, and then we would potentially lose some, some folks there. 
another idea that I've uh, tossed around, um, you know, that was a little bit even before this, but now could be adopted would be a free trial period for any new um, faculty or staff that are coming into the university. Um, how do we, you know, kind of get them in, let them sample what we all have, and then um, hopefully keep them around afterwards, because I, I agree that, you know, looking at where we were prior to this, and then where we will be after is, is going to be a, a different thing. So that could be a, another idea. And thank you for that comment as well, Aaron, on the member services. Yeah, they're, they're, I just signed up for it today. That's how I know about it. Um, there's going to be a member services roundtable on this Friday. It's noon. Actually, I probably shouldn't say at the time because I probably got it wrong. But um, it's I what I have on my calendar is noon Central Standard Time. So I would hope that this would be on their agenda to talk about how people are going to get people back. So we're, we're putting together uh, something and I've said it um, beforehand is I think people are really going to be looking when they come out of this COVID-19 on how we as employers or companies, universities, whatever it may be, took care of the people that are depending on us at that point. So uh, we've kind of looking at that membership drop and, and kind of flipping it and saying, you know, we're still providing that same high quality services and have kept everybody within the loop. And that we're hoping that, you know, when this does go by, you know, it doesn't matter about the LA fitness and the U fits and the stuff like that. They're going to come right back to us because, you know, we're the family that we built before this COVID-19. Um, I think a really good company, if nobody has, has looked at that or been there, is look at what Home, Home Depot is doing for their employees right now um, as a company. And, uh, you know, if you guys don't shop at Home Depot, not a spokesperson for them, but it might make you shop with them afterwards. Um, you know, how well they're taking care of those associates in the store. So I think that's another important, important part is that um, communication with those members. This is uh, Patty Emke from Michigan State University. And I don't know if anyone else here uh, on this call is from the state of Michigan, but we've been in a shelter in place. Universities are closed. We are not going to have classes at all for the summer. So we are in, and so we are in an online virtual uh, Reality, we aren't allowed to go into work. If we go into work, we have to register our temperature with our um, county health person. And, they take, and they're taking um, really uh, close looks at who has to go in. Um, there is in some areas a $1,000 fine if you're caught out and about and caught um, you know, within six feet of a person who is not in your immediate group. So we are pretty much on a lockdown. But as far as with our institutions, we have, and to answer someone's question besides what, what you're doing for your members, we um, have a pay to play membership. Our fitness, our group exercise, everyone has to pay for it. So what we've done is that we've gone to a total online virtual offering. So we are still offering about 27 group exercise classes and all kinds of other things. And it's all from our current employees. And they have created a Zoom community and so if you are in, um, and if you want to go to their class, they are um, offering Zoom classes all day long. Um, you, and people are in their garages, they're in, and it's kind of funny because it shows where, you know, it's kind of sort of personalized, but um, you can still follow your favorite instructor. There's no cost. We've given, we had to give all their money back. So we are probably about $170,000 that we had to give back for memberships because they can't use our facilities. But, those are some of the things we're doing. If someone wants to talk about off the, you know, um, off of this chat about some of the things that we're doing to make sure that we cultivate our membership, I'm more than happy to talk to you because we're doing lots of strategic planning and have been told to plan as though we will have no students. Great. What other, what other questions do y'all want to pose out there? We have topics, but if there's something burning, we want to make sure your, your information, your questions get answered as well. Um, I have a question regarding um, non-essential, essential. essential. Um, just wondering if anyone has gone through the process of actually changing from non-essential to essential. Um, the reason I ask is on, sorry if you hear the rain, it's 
downpouring right now. Um, on our aquatics call, we were talking, um, I had to go in, I was asked to go into work for backwashing, but I'm a non-essential employee, so I was feeling weird about it. Um, I ended up talking with my doctor going in, but my concern moving forward is if I need to do this again, I do think that I need to be deemed essential. And so a lot of people were talking about how CPOs are deemed essential, but I was wondering if anyone has gone through the process of like converting themselves from a non-essential employee to an essential employee, because I don't know, I, I don't think with our university that our CPOs are considered essential or they may just might not have even thought to label that as essential. So I'm not really sure. Um, so I was just curious if there was a process for people or it's more like you were just told. Yeah, I'll jump in on that one, Megan. So technically I'm essential. I don't, it's all because of the pool. Um, so our safety department, uh, our director talked to the safety department and myself and my supervisor, we got letters. Um, everyone else is closed off to our facility. Their cars don't work. And it's just a letter that if I get pulled over, um, saying that I'm essential just to go, it is to check on the pool. We have a pool where our pump house is getting renovated by Sunbelt currently. Um, so going in and checking in on them and then once they hand that over to us. Um, but we just had to talk to our safety department and we got an official letter from him saying that I'm essential and it kind of gives a broad reason why I'm essential. Um, so if I would, I would reach out to your safety department on campus first and see what their requirements are and what they're doing for their employees that are essential. And I know the same thing for our SSE and uh, um, some of our other individuals, plumbing and all these different people, they all have the same letters in their cars for the same reason. Yeah, we did the same thing at Notre Dame. Um, we limited the number of folks that could go to each facility just based off of need. Um, and then we've also had discussions of truly how essential from a budgetary piece is keeping the pool alive, basically. Um, so they've asked us also to uh, think about what it would take on the back end if we just went ahead and turned everything off and drained the pool. Uh, I know that that's not an option for some folks, uh, but it is something that probably would want to think about if it is an option for you. And then Megan, I think for that essential and non-essential, it, it can kind of flip-flop. So here at the city, our essential really are utilities, fire, police, um, and wastewater are really the four essentials. Um, now in my position, I'm considered essential to our parks and rec department, but that is really for, you know, just to keep our operations going as long as our pool does have water in it. Now, obviously, we're not going to be draining here, uh, you know, popping our pool out the ground. But um, in that case, you know, if they did go to just, a, you know, the essential and non-essential, I think that's very confusing right now because really you look at all states with stay-at-home orders, it looks like everybody is essential from down up. You know, it's kind of crazy. But I think for the essential, essential is definitely those um, ones who, you know, if their job stopped, we'd be in a really bad place. But I think for that, everybody's saying, I got a letter as well. If cops stop me, you know, here, I'm, I'm going to work back. It's not as crazy as where Patty is about getting fines, but I, I do know they have talked about down that is here because people are, you know, they're not listening. They're going to beaches. They're out, you know, out and about just driving around and such like that. But yeah, just ask for the letter and it should be able to give you one. Awesome. Hey, Shelby, I see your question in, um, in the chat. I think most of us keep this at least within our facilities because of MSDS procedures. Um, we have not posted ours, but I believe you should have a binder or, or something in your facility with all the products that you use and have the MSDS sheets in that binder would be my guess. Does anybody else want to Jump what was her question? I'm trying to find it. Um, it was, has anybody's university publicly posted the chemicals? They use the frequency, um, or do you post it, in, post it inside the facility at some place? Um, this is for when we all go back on site, obviously. Yeah, um, so when I first got uh, to Anne and Roberts, like I had to reach out to our custodial because we um, they purchased most of our chemicals, 
And so I'm still kind of in the hunt for most of them, but I have them in a binder and they're all in my office. And then they're also posted where the chemicals are at. Um, so in our uh, laundry rooms and then of course the pump house and then our custodial closet. But I did have to search for some and I'm still on the hunt for a couple. We actually do an electronic um, version of this through our risk management uh, office on campus. So they have an electronic record of not only what chemicals we use, but an inventory of each uh, in for each building. And we just periodically update that if anything new comes about every month when we sit down and do our in-person meeting with them. And also one more thing, Shelby, we are starting um, an Excel document that talks about almost every single space we own and that we have and what has been done in that space and what product and when and just anything about that for to go forward, especially for our opening, because um, I know we want to see YA as much as we can and document as much as we can. So we're, we're kind of taking it a step further as well. Shelby, does that help? And then, well, right, go ahead. If I may, uh, I, after reading Shelby's question, I read it as publicly putting it out there. I know all our departments keep that on file, uh, but I read Shelby's as who's, how are we conveying that to our patrons? Um, here at Central Washington University, we don't, uh, but that is a good question uh, because I know peace of mind is a big part for our patrons as they re enter our space. Uh, but publicly posting them, we, we have not. And then right below Shelby's question, Drew had one about, has anyone talked about how they would address increased cleaning of their turf fields, both indoor and outdoor moving forward? We've started the conversation in Notre Dame, um, just of how frequently we would continue to do this. That's part of our maintenance procedure as a summer piece. Uh, when we have everything repaired and inspected. Um, but other than just starting the conversation, we haven't gone any deeper into it. Same, same here, Drew. Um, I do know that direct sunlight and UV rays does kill COVID-19. But if you're in one of those dreary places, I used to live in the Midwest, where it felt like the sun didn't come out for like eight months. Um, Thanks, that Josie. Appreciate that. Issues. I'm just being honest, uh, but uh, we know we are using the sunlight and we are probably going to start increasing the times we do take the washer to the turf to disinfect it because we do have the indoor issue as well. Yeah, I was going to say, can you elaborate a little bit on the indoor turf and what procedures or maybe solutions that you use on that surface? Um, I have to get the exact cleaning solution, but our okay. strength and conditioning area, we have a, a turf area. Um, they do a big cleaning every month to where they basically come in early for about four hours and clean all the equipment and do a deep cleaning of that turf because it's so hard to do it while people are in the facility. Um, I believe that the chemical they probably use is just your, your standard simple green to wash that turf and then use a power washer. And then they have the little machine that drags over the turf to spray it too. So I'll touch base with them and see exactly um, what they use in their process for that and send it to you. That would be awesome. Thank you. Okay, and then Jeff, I also saw that you put a question in. You yeah. Want yeah, just wondering if obviously we're not going to hold students, uh, we're not going to hold it against them if they don't feel safe or they don't have the capacity to come back and, and work for us. But in terms of staffing and any issues that may arise by that, have you had any conversations about how you'll appropriately staff your facility or what you'll do um, with students who don't feel safe coming back to campus? What timelines might you be operating under? Um, we've had that discussion. We've started to gather personnel numbers on who plans to come back to campus once everything is quote unquote back to normal um, or once we have been given the okay to do so. But other than having those numbers, um, we haven't really taken the next step yet. Yeah, we, um, I'd say on top of adding the numbers, we also ask the question of how much notice do they need to get back? Um, so most of our set about a week, 
Um, but we've also told them that we're asking the same question and they're going to get tired of it after a while. Um, we told them on our Zoom meeting the other day, just get used to it. Uh, but we'll, we've been asking them every couple of weeks. Okay, so if it's now June, it does, your, does, does that change your mind? Um, if it keeps pushing back and we haven't had as many say no, surprisingly, as I thought we would, because they're ready to get out of the house and they want to work. Um, but the biggest thing is how much time they need to get back here and get ready to work, whether it's moving or stuff. And most of ours have said about a week notice. Yeah, Jeff, uh, kind of similar to what Megan talked about earlier with budgets, we create, we had to actually submit to our finance office um, three different plans of if we reopen, what our staffing structure could look like, like bare bones to operate and get by, how many staff do we need, how much money are we going to be spending on them. Um, so we're using that kind of bare bones model as a reference when we reach out to our staff with, okay, do I at least have one building manager and two rec attendants and, you know, somebody work the front desk, that type of thing. So uh, it'll also for us depend on, since we are, um, all of our students live on campus, um, it will really depend on if campus, like if they're allowed to move back into dorms, because that'll be a big effect for us is we don't have many students who commute in. So if they're not able to actually move back into a dorm room, um, even if they want to work, they most likely won't be able to because they won't be able to afford to live in an apartment off campus. Thanks. Drew, didn't you talk about in a call on Friday about how you're worried about kids being able to come back at all? Yeah, so the, one of the things, just to be completely honest, that we've had the discussion of is uh, not only are we concerned about the folks that may be returning to campus um, that work for us, but just in general, the students that may not be able to fiscally come back to school, um, whether that is specifically Notre Dame or just kind of across the country. I know that there are in the works of doing a lot of different scholarships and funds for students that might be underprivileged or just find themselves in a financial burden that uh, they may not be able to come back in the fall. So that's something that we're planning for. Um, I know here at, at Minnesota, they, they said to estimate our president during the Board of Regents last week to prepare for a 15 to 20% drop in enrollment. And for a campus of about 52,000 students, that's huge for us. And students are our biggest employ like student employees. So we've, we've prepared and working in IMs and clubs to potentially, if we're limited in the amount and scope we can offer programming is to start cross training all of our student employees and start putting them into different areas and different jobs to address that needs. And then even as a, as a full staff, asking where we can help out within the facility areas, within aquatics, within outdoor adventure, like whatever we can do to try to fill staffing uh, gaps once we get back at the beginning, just to try to give ourselves a foundation and off the ground, because if we don't have that even basic to be able to open up, I feel like we're going to continue to lose patrons and people who come into our facility. So it's just going to be harder for us to even function operationally going forward. Something to consider too would be if your university is on hiring freeze or not, because if we open, if that hiring freeze doesn't go away, we don't even have the opportunity to hire non-student casuals from the community who would be able to come into work. So that's going to play a big role in how and what staffing will look like for the facility. Trey, your, uh, your question in the comment about climbing walls, uh, climbing holds and things like that. Um, I actually just sent something or I just got an email a couple weeks ago about uh, how El Dorado specifically um, kind of suggests that you clean and sanitize uh, holds. Uh, if you are an El Dorado customer, you should have gotten that, but if not, feel free to send me an email um, and I can try to post that. It is on their website as well. Drew, will you throw your email address in the... Yeah. Thank you. Does anyone have any plans that are being put in place for individuals to come pick up their belongings from their lockers or um, lost and found items that they know that we may have and they want to claim? We're trying to stay compliant with what housing is doing for students who want to come back and pick up and, and officially move out um, of their dorms, but was wondering if that was a conversation y'all had in your facilities with um, picking up locker items. We were allowing them to come in before our stay at home 
And once we got put on stay at home, we have frozen all of that. They are, we are not allowed to open for them to come in and get their things. And I have received a couple lost and found requests that we have just We've told them once we're able to reopen and look into stuff, then we will get back to you. But unfortunately at this time, since we're on stay at home, mm -hmm. we're not allowed to do those things. Okay. And, and Jeff, similar to what you said, working with housing and doing what Aaron uh, just mentioned as well, you know, scheduling appointments for one-to-one, -one. Uh, somebody coming in has, has been okay. We've had uh, several hundred people come pick up their items uh, from their lockers. But additionally, we have moved forward with extending the uh, end date of lockers. It will not be ending in May as a typical spring semester. Uh, we've extended it through the entirety of the, the summer semester as well at no additional charge. Um, so that anyone with items in their lockers uh, can feel comfortable that, that they can come in and get them at any time. Um, now, certainly that's not going to uh, take care of the people who have left and may not come back. And I think we need to be prepared to deal with those situations on, a, on an individual basis uh, as we reach out. Um, but being open, like all this other stuff, being open with the members that have their lockers, using the membership software to uh, send communications to those that currently have uh, items still in lockers has been very successful. And I, and I think by extending the, uh, the cleaning date and the membership date for lockers has put a lot of people at ease. Um, but just communicating that uh, repeatedly has been helpful. Appreciate it. Hello, this is uh, Casey Toberg from Georgia State. Um, just wanted to pose this question kind of related to lockers. Um, for those of us who may not uh, be opening until fall, because it, it looks as though that could be our situation, um, have any of you started to talk about how you'll handle, handle lockers uh, in that scenario? So we initially talked about extending them through summer. Is anyone thinking of extending them through fall or any discussions on that? My guess, if we're staying closed, we're just going to keep pushing and pushing and pushing the extend date would be my guess. I'm not, um, but that would be my guess as to how we were going to be handling that is as long as it keeps getting pushed back, we will keep pushing it back. And that's where the flexibility of, you know, not having an official reopen date is actually helpful in this case um, because we can just keep being fluid with the situation. All right, looks like we have seven more minutes. Do we have um, any other burning questions? What about things as it relates to uh, student training and the use of potentially more virtual training uh, in that? Has anybody kind of thought about how some of the things that we have typically done in the past that have required to bring them in, uh, we may use some of the new tools that we've all learned in the recent weeks? Yeah. Good afternoon. Oh, sorry, Aaron. Go ahead. <laughs> you go for it. Go for it. Um, so I actually just had this conversation um, with my supervisor. Um, so we have a lot of students who didn't get to attend an, a new employee orientation employee action plan training before they finish their onboarding because we went to stay at home. Um, my presentation is already in a PowerPoint format. So something that I'm working on is a proposal where I will be using my talking points in a presentation, like in a Zoom video, either pre-recorded or just doing it live with the students there um, and sending out the direct link for EAP. Um, obviously we can't really do that for anything American Red Cross related um, because there is that in skills portion. Um, in regards to like for specifically my lifeguards, we're actually about to do a hiring. So the one thing we're saying is that we're going to go through with the interviews and, and whatnot, but we are telling them that their employment is contingent upon an in skill session, which they will complete once we get back to campus, hopefully fall, maybe earlier. Um, 
I haven't been told of any other risk management training that we're going on that we're putting online. But yeah, as far as I know, at least the emergency action plan is something we're looking at um, doing online with the possibility of adding some quiz material. Um, we use Blackboard at Towson, so we originally tried to do quizzes on Blackboard and then we were having some problems, but I'm guessing we're going to have to try to go back to that too as a way to assess whether or not they understood the concepts in that presentation. As some of the other people are listening in here, we use Canvas as well. That's the, that's our Blackboard. Um, so we've been using that for, to add our stuff. We're also creating a uh, a new employee orientation um, module that will go on our UT Learn website. Hopefully, we're having to use a special software to create this to make sure that it's accessible to all um, disability levels. So I know that there's things we have to think about in that sense as well. I have a hearing impaired and a visually impaired student on my staff that I have to take into consideration when I am doing these virtual um, new learning opportunities. So just something to, for everybody else to keep in mind as well. I've been doing uh, training and assessment through videos. Um, I do a lot of work for the American Canoe Association and travel around the country and teach. And I've had to do um, evaluation. So I know I'm planning for our outdoor adventures program in the fall where we have lots of technical skill stuff and some of the outdoor rec round tables that we've had. We've talked about how to physically assess skills over video uh, that you might otherwise do in person. So, you know, looking at if you're doing a CPR and first aid course, um, you know, how realistic and what is the uh, ratio, um, camera angles, timelines, like really kind of getting into it and looking at, can I observe this person do a physical skill over live video or can it record it with some guidance and send it to you and I can do it in slow-mo and provide feedback. And, well, it's certainly not in-person training. Um, if that's what we have to do to try and like get people to maintain their certifications, I know that the uh, wilderness medical certifications are providing some online quizzes for extensions of certifications and some different tools, and they're looking at um, video assessment as well as a way to um, potentially extend certifications, maybe at least some some of the time, if not a complete research. So there are some options out there to um, not fully waiting on being in person for some basic skills. Awesome. All right, maybe time for one more. All right, so we're looking at do. <laughs> Great question. <laughs> Um, hey, Megan, do you want to talk about um, how you had your virtual in service and they got, didn't get paid and they all attended? <laughs> so it's so, so okay. So we did um, an in service um, recently. Um, it was our previously scheduled in service. Um, I had talked to my supervisor about, okay, like, what am I, how are we going to handle this? And she's like, well, you can't do skills and whatnot. You can probably have, do quizzes and stuff. And then I actually decided, um, based on an aquatics call that I was on, to just use it as a check-in opportunity for my students. Um, and I told them beforehand, I'm like, look, this is going to be voluntary. Like, you're not getting paid for this. I would be very upfront with you, but if you want to jump on and see how each other are doing, feel free. And to my surprise, I think all but maybe two of my guards, and actually one was working, so they couldn't be available, um, were on that call. Um, I asked them questions like, how are their online classes going? How are they handling not having like a new normal? Are they getting workouts in? And then I shared all of the resources that we had been communicated with from our you know, higher ups, but also resources that we as a department had worked on. So we have posted group exercise classes online virtually. Um, there's the NURSA recreation movement, things like that. Um, with them. And then we just took the opportunity to kind of talk about some pop culture things. So Tiger King was a very big and popular topic. We discussed all the memes that we enjoyed. Um, we talked about, um, we also talked about like some of the positives that they had, you know, like what from 
this whole stay at home orders and all of that, like what has been great for them. So they, a lot of them talked about spending time with their pets or this or that. Um, afterwards, I received an email from one of my students who is one of seven at the house. Um, she's kind of the black sheep of the family. And she said she really appreciated the call. Um, I almost cried and by almost, I mean, I was sobbing. Um, it was great to know that they appreciated that. Um, what's kind of funny though, is after all of this, because it was scheduled, they actually did in fact get paid, but they didn't know that until afterwards because I didn't know that until afterwards. So um, yeah, I mean, training's gonna be hard at this point. Um, I think unless, unless your whole department is making it that it's a requirement, otherwise you're not going to be employed anymore. Um, you know, I, I just took it as an opportunity to check in with my students because they, they really want it more than they, for, than they know, so. I'm not sure if anybody else is doing this, but at Columbia, we actually are paying our students through May 15th. So that's also incentive to say, hey, you are getting paid. Um, give us a couple hours and do this training online. Um, I don't know, I mean, I'm sure everybody has their eyes on it, but Natalie's made some great uh, comments about how she's gotten people to participate in some trainings um, that I definitely think we'll implement here. Yeah, um, I shared it in, I think, two other round tables. I did a connect to accident report where they did their uh, fun scene from their favorite TV show. So I did my example of, Jim Halpert uh, filling out an accident report on Meredith getting bit by a bat and my witnesses were Kevin and Kelly from the show. Um, so it's kind of, I mean, it's still practicing um, what they would do at work, but in a little more fun aspect. And I actually have to credit one of my students for that idea. So definitely ask um, some of your students, especially kind of like the leaders, like, hey, if I gave you online work, what would you want? And so she was like, let's do something fun. And that's what she gave me. Um, and then I did like a bingo card since you keep seeing those on Instagram, social media, of people um, having quarantine bingo and things like that. Um, but it's filled with a bunch of scenarios from allergic reactions to someone um, hurting their ankle on court one, things like that. So they have to type up what they would do in that scenario and then fill out a report as needed if necessary. And then also do like a leadership development piece of uh, one of the leadership competencies that they would use during that. Um, and how um, and how that relates. So the bingo card also kind of gives them that freedom of what five scenarios they want to fill out. Awesome. Thank you everybody so much for participating. And we, like we said, we are having another one of these, April 30th. Um, uh, Chad put the, the Google doc that we are looking for suggestions from um, up at the top. So please click on that and get us any more questions, comments that you all have that you want to talk about in the next one of these and we'll meet and discuss. Um, again, thank you so much for this. It's, it's awesome. Just like our students need these check-ins, I think we do as well um, to just see each other and be able to talk to each other, especially since we didn't get to have the national conference this year. So I really love that everybody comes on and talks about all of these all of their stuff and just seeing everybody's faces. It's been awesome. So we hope to see you all April 30th. Thank you so much. Bye.